Welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Amy Milne, Executive Director of the Quilt Alliance. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad that you're here today. And I'm in Morganton, North Carolina. And I'd like to invite you to let us know where you're uh, joining us from today in the chat box. It's always fun to see who's in the audience. As you probably know already, Textile Talks is a weekly series presented on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time in partnership by the Quilt Alliance and our three wonderful partner organizations shown here. Um, if this is your first Textile Talk, I hope you'll come back. I hope you'll keep uh, joining us and I hope you'll check the YouTube channel where all the recordings are. Each uh, are almost all of our textile talks uh, are recorded and you can watch them at your convenience anytime. Um, thank you to our sponsors. You just saw their logos on the video that Lucy played. They are an invaluable part uh, of our team and also donors like uh, you um, provided, I think 11% of our operating budget for the series. Um, in the past year. So you generous attendees have been showing your love and your appreciation for Textile Talks uh, in a big way. And I wanna thank you on behalf of all my partners for helping us sustain this program. We'll put the link in the chat now for our donation page. If you're able and you're interested, please consider making a contribution today. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Quilt Alliance, our mission is to document, preserve, and share the stories of quilts, all quilts, and all quilt makers. You can find our projects, events, and resources on our website at www.quiltalliance.org. This year is our 30th anniversary as an organization, and to celebrate, we're thanking our members with a birthday block of the month challenge. Uh, you can join at any point this year or make a donation of at least $30 and you'll receive all of the block patterns and instructions. If you start late, you'll be able to access all nine of the block patterns and instructions. And my colleague, Emma Parker, uh, is going to add that link to the membership and the block of the month info in the chat box now. Just a quick reminder uh, to please use the chat box for greetings or comments or if you need technical help. Um, so we'll be sure to see them. Please add your questions for Thomas or for me uh, to the Q&A box. That way we can keep them separate. We'll try to find your uh, questions in the chat box, but it's e easier if you can put them in the Q&A box. And that way if Emma can answer a question with a URL, uh, with a link or something, she can just paste it in right away. But please feel free to add your questions at any time, your comments. We love a lively chat box. Um, so feel free to, to, as you're watching Thomas's lecture, um, to add in your questions uh, as they come to you. You can also turn on live captions by clicking on the live transcript or CC button on your Zoom controls. And uh, we hope you'll take advantage of that if that's of use to you. Today, I'm pleased to have artist Thomas Knauer join us on Textile Talks to talk about letters, numbers, words, and sentences on quilts. Um, and I, I'm going to have Emma paste in Thomas's website and uh, social media links in the chat box as well. So if you'd like to reach out and do some more research on his work or contact him, you can. I first met Thomas in 2013 at the first QuiltCon where he had, uh, he graciously agreed to let us interview him and a number of other exhibiting artists for the Quilt Alliance's Go Tell It project. Um, talking about his quilt on exhibit uh, that was on exhibit called In Defense of Handmade. You can find that on our YouTube uh, channel, and Emma will put all of these links in the chat as well. Uh, we also, in April of 2020, which was the month that Textile Talks started, if I'm not mistaken, Thomas invited us into his home studio for an interview and tour as part of our Story Beat project. Um, hi, Thomas. 
Hello. And he, we were just talking about it. It was so fun. And that was at the very beginning of the pandemic, but he was so cool. He was cool as a cucumber. And we got to see his workspace. We got to see his um, talk about his work. So that's episode 27 of Story Beat. And it is just for members, but today, uh, for the next month, we'll make it open um, to the public. So that link is, un is um, public. And then later that year, Thomas was host of uh, Yannick and Smucker's guest, second guest on our uh, podcast, Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast. Uh, that was our second episode. So you have been in the thick of our content for quite some time, Thomas, and we've been so fascinated by your work. And that's what really, um, what I know that you're going to share today with, with our guests. Um, Thomas lives in a small village in upstate New York with his wife, two children, and a dragon. Maybe maybe you can elaborate on that. He spends much of his time exploring the minutia of letters and numbers, words and sentences. He loves words in just about any form from letterpress printing to multimedia development. So it is no surprise that his work has taken a turn down the path of text-based quilts. He began his professional life teaching design at Drake University before turning to quilting. He has designed fabrics for several leading manufacturers, and his work has been exhibited in quilt shows and museums across the country, including the International Quilt Museum, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, and the Quilt Festival in Houston. His work typically focuses on issues of social justice and violence, his most recent body of work deals with the recent police shootings of unarmed African Americans. Knauer has authored several books prior to Quilt Out Loud and plans to keep writing as long as people will let them. Let him. We will. Um, before we get started, I just want to note that many of the quilts included in Thomas's lecture will address do address difficult issues, including racism, sexism, gun violence, and sexual assault. I'm going to turn it over to you, Thomas. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, technology. Full screen. There we go. Um, letters, numbers, words, and sentences. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with a little historical context. Uh, if you don't mind. Not a exhausted historical context, but uh, the, the pieces that have most influenced me um, in getting into text on quilts. The first being signature quilts. I'm, I've always been fascinated by these signature quilts as a sort of proxy for community. Um, the intimate private quilt becomes a communal object in having all these people participate in it. it. It sort of forms a community of names, and those names stand for people. They are people. And so how a quilt can take complete strangers and bring them together into a common space uh, to me, was a really powerful idea. Um, and it also works on, on a couple of different levels as far as temporality. Sorry. Um, quilts we think of as multi-generational objects, or at least I do. Things that will be passed down, things that will survive and continue to be used or at least seen. And that's the purpose of text. It's there to supplement speech for when we can't be there to talk to someone else. Text is all about making language permanent. Um, so when we double those, uh, the permanence of a quilt and the historical, the historicity of a quilt and the permanence of text, we get this sort of super permanence, something that is uniquely resistant to erasure. Um, and I think in that, we, when you see a text quilt, you know you're seeing something different. 
the words are going to function in a manner unlike you are used to. It is not like paper and pencil. It is of a whole different materiality. And I think that materiality changes language itself. Then, of course, the other big influence, I told you I was going to be brief, um, is the Names Project, the AIDS quilt. Um, I was just so moved by, I've never seen it in its totality, I've seen fragments, but I'm moved by all the different tones of voice that come together in this monumental project. Um, and it's that it's those two ideas are really important to me and my work. And I think to text quilts in general, what is the tone of voice? Some of these are about sorrow and loss. Some of these are celebrations of the person's life who is now gone. Um, they run the emotional gamut, but then they come together and create something else. And again, that's, for me, it's that notion of the monumental. It is, it transcends human scale and speaks in a way that a single quilt couldn't. Um, and that's really where I then bring my interest in series of quilts comes from this idea of producing monuments with quilts. Um, There's close up, just so much text and language in the names project, in the AIDS quilt, that it's just an overload of speaking, of writing, of storytelling, of remembering. And that's really what text and quilts are all about, is they are memory devices. Some of my more direct influences, and I think the, not just my influence is some of the most influential quilters using text at the moment. Uh, Schmidt, I love her work in that she uses such straightforward language. She's not obfuscating, she's not um, hiding things away or making it difficult. The text is straightforward, but so often is done in improv lettering that points to a, not casualness, but a imperfectibility um, of finding one's way through the language. Um, she's working at forming these letters and words as opposed to simply using perfected typography. And I think that play of, permanence and the feel of the accidental come together to make her pieces when they are improv, um, especially wonderful. There's a joy to them. Even when she's talking about something a little painful, um, there's an optimism behind it that is, I think, truly unique to her work. Um, Heidi Parks tells intimate stories, embroiders text into and onto a quilt, and you can see in this slide what the text is. Um, but it's really interesting to me to, this one's almost like quilt as diary. And I think that's a very powerful idea, doubling the intimacy. The diary is an intimate object, and so is a quilt. And in layering those two ideas together, you again produce what I would call a hyper intimacy. I'm really interested in how materials and text, materials and language, and materials and meaning sort of lay on top of each other to produce an even larger meaning. Um, and I think going into quilts with text, you are set up to produce 
depth and breadth of meaning. Um, Hillary Goodwin uh, is, well, I'll stop, I won't, I'll, is fantastic, but um, her quilts sort of inhabit the text. These were whole numbers, but they've been cut apart and fragmented because they're, they are what's on the Narcan pill, um, the, the anti-OD med, um, and the experience, if you are at that point, your life is very fragmented. Your brain is fragmenting. Everything is fractured. And so to take those numbers that would normally be so simply put and to break them apart and to throw them into chaos is a reflection of a mood and of an experience through the handling of the text. And that to me is again, really taking advantage of material conditions that quilts make possible that you might not ever do with a pencil and paper. Finally, I couldn't go any further without stopping with Sean Kimber. Um, this quilt to me is one of the most powerful quilts I've seen. In essence, I am a sophisticated cotton picker. It's so self-reflexive. It's such an acute eye on the state of society and race. It, it just one phrase gets at so much. And that's, I think Sean's great skill is in manipulating language so carefully that she can be so expansive with her messages without having to write an essay. Um, and these people are, are out there now making more, pushing further, and they are the ones who, who inspire me to push my own work. And I'm going to jump into some of mine just because it's best for illustrating some ideas. Pointing. Um, text points towards other things according to some theories of language. I'll put that caveat in. Text points towards stuff, um, ideas, materials, objects, people, whatever. This one is entitled In Defensive Handmade. It is lovingly known as Martha because it is the, it is the barcode and UPC number of a mass produced Martha Stewart quilt made for Macy's. I went to Macy's, bought one, scanned the barcode in so I could blow it up huge. The quilt is 90 by 90. Um, and then turned that into a pattern and then returned the quilt and made a quilt of the barcode, which is that really the barcode is the moment an object officially becomes a participant in commerce. When the, bar, when the barcode is scanned, the money has to come out. And it's that relationship of, I guess, craft entering into capitalism in a strange way, in a mass produced way that it's no longer craft, it's production. Um, I think there's something special about the handmade, the homemade. And for me, it's about the value of labor. Um, your labor is part of your life. It is time you are living and giving that time to a project, to doing something, to making something for someone or for yourself. And in and of itself, it is valuable and meaningful. And that's absent in the mass produced product. Um, so I wanted to find a location and that's where I think of a barcode as, it is a location where 
the intimacy of the material object breaks down because it suddenly is participating in something beyond itself, the economic situation, the economic exchange, as opposed to the gift exchange that is so natural to quilting. Um, on a similar topic, um, this one just is, I designed an alphabet for piecing. And I think piecing is very different than um, applique. Applique, the letters or numbers are applied to the surface. With piece letters, they are part of the surface. They are in it, not on it. Um, and that puts them in a different position. And I think these material differences have subtle importance. Um, but this one, you know, is much more of a declaration than Martha, which is sort of a visual or textual slate of, sleight of hand going from the UPC to the object and back to the quilt. This one just declares. Um, and there's a power in declaration. I think of a lot of Sean's work, um, Sean Kimber's work uh, as declarative. It is taking a position through a quilt, one that will endure. And it's again, with, when I talk about a quilt, I'm always talking about the enduring object. Um, so this will forever not be a product. It is something made for someone at a time. And that's unique. That is the antithesis of product. And I think that's what we quilters are doing. And I think that's part of why quilters are so committed to their practice because it is resonant um, at its core. Just some nice little straight lines. Uh, this one, my Amazon quilts, the secret life of quilts, Amazon specific identification code, or I think it might actually be number. I may have gotten it wrong, but it doesn't matter. Number three is the top one. And this one is again, that loop outward. This set of letters and numbers points to an object that Amazon sells and then implies a return of that object back to the home that contains this quilt. Um, all of the objects that these quilts point to are sexual aids. Uh, this one is actually a lubricant. Um, and I was really interested in that sort of the intimacy of the quilt, but also the sort of how we like to show off our quilts, but we hide away our private lives. I, you know, um, Amazon allows this anonymity that a quilt doesn't. Quilts are personal. An Amazon order is anonymous or virtually anonymous. And I liked that pointing out but not knowing what's being pointed to. Um, it's, um, it, it allows for a gap in meaning. And that's what these, this is a series of four quilts. That's what these quilts are really about, the gap in knowledge um, that can happen with encoded text, um, as this is a type of code for um, record keeping only. Um, and lovely straight lines. I love straight lines, especially when they don't go over the PC or the applique, but I will move on. Um, one more of pointing. This is one of my favorite quilts because um, it points in such a weird way. It is an old bed sheet uh, with two to seven years applicate on 
And then the flower motifs of the sheet are quilted around very delicately. So it's all about the contrast of the delicacy and the harshness of the text. But what does two to seven years mean? We're given information, but we have to go to the title to get the context. So we're kind of getting the second piece of information first, and the, what would normally come first comes second, the title. Two to seven years is the sentencing guideline for second degree rape. And this quilt was made because I'm still not so much confused, but irate over the idea of a second degree rape. It's rape or it's rape. Um, it seems relatively simple. I know it gets couched in date rape versus assault, but rape is rape and we don't need second degree rape and two to seven years is never enough. Um, and then I just jumped up on my soapbox, sorry. Um, but I'm interested in these, as we'll see as I go forward, I'm very interested in how the language on a quilt can contrast with the aesthetics of the quilt to produce a jarring effect. Often, whether you get the harsh language first and then the gentle space second, as I think you do with this one, or vice versa, you're given you encounter a beautiful quilt that then is actually quite distressing. Um, how one can play different tones of voice off of each other can produce cognitive dissonance through an object that we expect to be, well, friendly. And, cognitive, and what I'm doing and what a lot of these quilters that use text are finding ways to be somewhat unfriendly to make you work and think and reevaluate um, your positions, the context in which you see things. Um, codes, let's move to codes. I love working in codes, um, not just Amazon codes, but things like Braille, Morse code, binary, you name it, I like it. Um, we'll start with this one uh, that I made for my, uh, that, well, I made with help from friends around the world, uh, made this quilt for my daughter and it is in binary code. Um, you, you can see these little white squares if they're down, they're a zero, up is a one. So it's zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one for that first block. And that happens to be the binary code for the letter S. So each block forms a letter until the 16 blocks spell out the phrase smart is beautiful. Now, I made this for my daughter when they were about eight. So I wanted them to understand something really important. She, they are, they're, they're a lovely child, but their brain is so beautiful. Um, and I want them to be aware of all the ways in which they are beautiful um, and remarkable. So I made this quilt for them and um, it's binary is this wonderful language where it is just simply oppositions. Could it have just been made in black and white stripes or uh, half and half, anything? Um, any duality can be a design, design model for working in binary code. And it felt extra geeky to, um, you know, say smart is beautiful and binary. And if you can look along this bit of piecing, you can see there are sometimes large gaps and sometimes short gaps between the straight line quilting. Well, a small gap is a zero, a large gap is a one, and the quilting itself spells out smart is beautiful in binary code because I'm a really big geek. Um, this one's part of a series 
um, of marriage quilts I made for my wife. Uh, I think of them not as, you know, they're not so much wedding quilts about the wedding day, but about having your vows live through the entirety of your marriage. And we used some variations on the vows from the common book of prayer. And so this one says, and thereto I plight thee my troth. Um, and in Morse code, so it's dots and dashes. Um, completely hidden that it says anything. It could just be abstract, but not too hard to figure out. Um, little, much easier to figure out and read than the binary code would be. But I like the idea of it being codes allowing for private languages that my wife and I know what this says, no one else needs to. My daughter and I know what smart is beautiful says, no one else needs to. Others do, but they're not really part of that, the intimacy of the object and the language. And I like that, you know, you can pull that off, truly intimate language by, in working with a quilt in that my daughter sleeps under their quilt almost every night. And there's, it's almost as if I'm giving them a hug with that message as they sleep, which is a little cheesy, but also I think kind of important. Um, Again, I wouldn't be me if I didn't, you can't see it all that well, but it's quilted in Morse code to spell out the entirety of our wedding vows. Another one in Morse code, a little simpler, and it just says troth, uh, which means like myself, my truth, my everything. Uh, but it was done in pride flag colors. And it's, again, I'm really interested in Again, combining languages or combining codes. Morse code compare, combined with the code of the pride flag colors then makes this clearly about um, same-sex marriage, LB, LGBTQ plus issues, um, and a whole series of things follow or flow through the concatenation of a word and a color palette that both have both have powerful significance. I hope. I hope I'm making sense. I can't see anyone. It's distressing. Braille may be my favorite because it's the most taxing. Braille is always two across, each letter is two across and three units down. And they would be dots or bumps or flat. In the case of this quilt, red half square triangles signify bumps, yellow half square triangles signify flat areas. So this is the coat, this is the braille for uh, the letter L this first two across and three down. And the whole quilt spells out a quote from Shakespeare uh, from All's Well That Ends Well. And it is made for my son who was about seven at the time. And it says, love all, trust a few, do wrong to none. And I think that's pretty good advice. Um, he's, He's growing up to be an incredibly kind boy, um, and I am very proud of him. Um, but the thing is, is with codes, as long as you satisfy the basic necessity of the code, i.e. the right parts are in the right places, you can play with it and do a meta design, the diamond and diamond that I've messed up a little bit um of the overall quilt 
does not disrupt the raised dots and flat spaces implied by the color choices, if that makes sense. I hope so. Another one using Braille, the word flight is pieced in circles and spelled out. And plight doesn't mean what it used to mean. Uh, it means to promise or to pledge. It does not mean like this is my plight Ugh, and you're you know, stuck. It is to promise or to pledge. And so here, the word plight is where Matilda, my daughter, used to sleep when they were little. And my wife slept on this side with her head curled up around them. And I slept on this side with my knees curled up under them. And that's how we slept together as a family. And that whole relationship is described by a few circles and a few and a couple of lines. Um, I hope. Um, but I think then it becomes more about gesture as much as it becomes as, as it is about language. Though at the other end, this one is quilted with our complete wedding vows in three quarter inch high letters. So, which is why it is lovingly titled, it takes a million stitches to tell you how much I love you because I went over a million stitches quilting it. This is like the third quilt I ever quilted. Thank goodness for computers. Um, I should look at the time. Okay, we're good. Data visualization, I'll speed up a little. Um, I like data. I think data speaks volumes. Um, and data is so often a repetitive thing. We learn from data by making comparisons. So there's a lot of repetition and quilts are good spaces for repetition. This one's called Numbers Parkland. Um, and it's the ages of all the victims at the Parkland shooting. And there are a whole lot of 14 year olds. And I think the numbers sitting there, when you realize what they are, it's quilted with all their names. Um, when you realize what those numbers are, it just sinks in how young these children were. Um, at least I think it does. It does for me. Of uh, just all these 14 year olds, which is how old my daughter is right now, just gone. Um, and the tragedy is just too immense. And I think it's on numbers set you up. They pretend they're objective, but they stand for something very personal, very meaningful. They're not just abstract. Numbers make sense. They make meaning of the world. So you can see the quilting a little bit better. This one is pie charts and they are the income distribution of various G20 countries. And it has two parts at play. You make comparisons within each pie chart with blue being the top 20%, then purple the next 20, red the next 20, uh, orange the next 20, and green the bottom 20 percent. And so you can see like one country has a little more of this than, you know, a little more orange than the other country, or a little more red or a little less blue. But you look at them all and you see predominantly blue. The top 20% roughly has earns, well, earn, I don't know if earns is the word, but um, takes in roughly 50% of the world's of the, of the income in these countries. If I had done it on wealth, the pie charts would be broken. Um, but income is slightly more equitable than wealth. 
And then the United States is popped out on a white square and is quilted with a quotation from Martin Luther King Jr.'s Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech in which he compares modern poverty to cannibalism, um, that we are essentially eating ourselves by allowing the poor to starve. Um, it, it's unconscionable. Um, so we're getting into the next section or hinting at the next section of how much I like quilting with words. But here, just again, I'm very interested in, again, and in, I keep saying again, I'm very interested in how numbers and how data speaks beyond itself. This one is COVID, October, I can't see because of various Zoom things, but October, I think 10th to the 17th or 11th to the 17th. And each number is the number of people who had died up until that day. So the first day, then the second day, there are 1,800 more dead. And there's more. And each day, the number grows. Um, and I think that simple recognition, we kind of, I think a lot of us, kept the pandemic at arm's length as much as we could as an abstract people are dying people are getting sick we know these things but we don't sit down with the i think the full force of the magnitude um at this point in the pandemic it was roughly two thousand people a day um and just seeing the numbers, take those leaps of 2,400 deaths, 1,800 deaths, is just the monotony and repetitiveness that, again, is so natural to quilt, quilting becomes a bombardment of not just information, but of meaning, of sorrow, of, of loss. And the numbers alone can speak of that probably far better than I could write about that. And then to set up a contrast, it is quilted in a nice, lovely floral motif. Um, Cause I want, I wanted it to feel uncomfortable. It, roll flowers, are they celebration? Like, like, are they lost flowers? Why, what, are they, what exactly are they doing here? They seem to not belong. And that not belonging, I think, applied to so many things during the depths of the pandemic. There wasn't room for much besides being careful and trying to stay safe. So on to stitches. This one is called Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. And on one side is a full-size AR-15 reverse applique. Um, and the other side of the bed is empty. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions. Um, and it is quilted with the names of shooting victims that had been Oh, I can't remember what year it started. I should be able to. But uh, I believe it was Slate started just a list of death by guns. And I just started with the first name on the list and got through as many names as I could until I ran out of quilt. Um, and there were a lot of names. And there were a lot of names I could not fit. Uh, countless names. Um, I like accumulation um, and uh, the way information accumulates to say more than just its parts. Um, it's not narrative, it is piling on. And I think language 
in the context of a quilt, when you do that accumulative game, you are adding weight, emotional weight to the quilt that is mirrored by its physical weight that is, again, very different than writing something on a laptop. This one's called Your Heritage is Written in Other People's Blood. And it's made of a whole bunch of 12 by 18 Confederate flags, which kind of sort of a little bit hide away in diamonds and shapes and things, but they're still flags and they're not pieced very well because they were nylon and I didn't think they deserved terribly careful handling, but then they're quilted with the names of lynching victims from an archive of historic records. And the saddest thing about that archive was the most common name listed for lynching victims was not a name at all, but was simply unnamed Negro because no one bothered to find out who they actually killed. Um, and here's, I guess in this quilt, you really get to the point of quilting text into a quilt is that you're wetting them. You're making it almost impossible to remove or erase or take, a, take away. You're stitching into those flags indelibly these lynchings so that you can't have the Confederate flag without the history of lynching um, or the Confederate battle flag, which I guess this is technically. Um, and I think that the idea of stitching letters, numbers, words, sentences into a quilt takes on an extra indelibility. Um, it is a move of absolute permanence and it's there, but it's not really there the way applique or piecing would be. It's, becomes it becomes the surface, not something on the surface or in the surface or co-equal with the surface. It creates a surface that is to be read. Um, this one is called Chronic. I'm tired of being sick and I like working on old bed sheets. And then this one is called that because it is written in my handwriting, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, I'm tired of being sick. And then one time in black ink, so you can actually read it, not black ink, black thread, so you can actually read it. But it just says it again. And that to me is the essence of chronic illness of which I have uh, in spades. Um, that that waking up in the morning and having two seconds before you remember that, before you feel your body not feeling well, um, before it kicks in or you notice, you have a couple seconds of just waking up and being before you realize you're tired of being sick. Um, so again, each one of these, Language always produces a tone of voice and it creates a tone of voice through its material, at least text, through its material decisions. Um, the bed sheet, the invisible quilting, the one line that you can read, all set up a certain tone of voice of experiencing this alone. Um, and I will race. I have how many? Do I need to stop? Yeah, I think we do need to. I hate to okay. interrupt, but I do want to have enough time for questions because there are many, many questions. Okay. And I'm sorry to interrupt because we can't get enough of this, Thomas. There's this is such an engaged group. What you're saying is so fascinating. Your approach and what you said uniquely, I took so many notes, uniquely text and quilt being uniquely resistant to erasure is such a powerful thing to say, but to do it in work, in objects is so stunning. And I know that one of the things that, um, we've got a bunch of questions, but one of them is, 
maybe I'll do a follow up to this, but how does a declarative quilt differ from a declarative painting? You talked a little bit about the, the qualities of textiles. A painting could be on fabric too, but what's the difference? Um, one is, I think, the manner of production. Painting is already a writerly activity. It's, it's akin to, it's in the same family as holding a pen. You are marking on the surface with pigment, which is not what you're doing with applique or piecing. You are making something usable with a quilt, while paintings rarely get used. Right. Um, so I think there's a difference to have a declaration on a wall mm -hmm versus a declaration on a bed. And to declare something on your own bed, it takes this reflex, it has this reflexive element. You're declaring to yourself. You are saying to yourself something important that you need to remember. And I think that's, and, and quilts are memory objects. They hold memories for generations. So I think they're uniquely suited for that kind of declaration um, to hit home because it will do it again and again. And it and quilts resist the viewerly distance, um, the dispassionate eye mm -hmm. in the museum. They resist it when you're under it because you're comfortable, cozy, happy. Yeah. Or miserable or whatever emotion, but you're living with it, not looking at it. Right. More likely to be embraceable or somehow reach you in a different way. Um, that was that question was from Nolan Wright. This question is question, next question is from Cheryl uh Batiato. I hope I got that right, Cheryl. She said, why is much of your text in parentheses? Is there any um what is, what is that decision about? Um, it depends, you know, it so often depends on the text. Um, let me, so a lot of my text is not in parentheses, but the parenthetical usually means there's, I mean, I guess that would be, I use it for, almost what you would call adjacent information. Right. The ISIN codes, the Amazon codes, they're not the name of the thing, they're thing adjacent. Right. Two, seven years is not second degree rape, it's the sentencing of second degree rape. It puts it as something that's not, it's not necessarily primary. Right. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I want it to be like I, I've taken something from the side and put it front and center for you to examine. Yeah. Because that's what a parenthetical is. It's an right. aside, essentially. Um, Kate Parker asks, thinking about the longevity of quilts and their language, how do you label the back of your quilts? Um, and the second follow-up to that is, do you provide a decoding, so to speak, for future generations, or do you prefer to leave them as secret codes? Um, the code quilts are almost exclusively family quilts. If you haven't, if you might have noticed that the binary code is for my daughter, the braille is one braille for my son. Braille for my wife, Braille. Yeah, those are family pieces. So they are, assumedly, if they're handed down, the story will be handed down with them and they'll stay in the family. Um, the other ones with just fragments of language or whatnot, I want you to have to puzzle it out. Like this one in the video, he can be seen raising his arms in the middle of the street. Well, you can Google that and it'll take you to a newspaper article about a police shooting. But you, you see that and you kind of already know what it is. 
Um, I don't, I don't like the, I like, I'm fine with titles and little artist statements next to them, but somehow attaching the, the answer key, so to speak, to the back seems It seems too controlling. I'm willing to let it be hard. Um, as far as labeling, I have a lot of labeling to do. <laughs> Busted. I went in such a frenzy of making for Quilt Out Loud that none of them got labeled. Because it was just making like 25 new quilts in yeah. a short period of time. It's a lot. So I have a lot of labeling to do. <laughs> if I'm a good human being. Yeah. Keep setting a good example. Um, you're getting so I hope you're seeing the chat because you're getting so many interesting and thoughtful and warm comments. And we'll be able to save the chat for you to see. Um, so one of the questions, let's see, let me go back just a little bit. So it says, please explain, this is from Lauren Krauss, please explain the lengthy description on the left on two to seven years. Is that your artist statement? Is that text on the front of the quilt, on the label? I can't tell from the image. I think that was a, maybe an excerpt from the book. Yeah, would, yeah, the know. pages are excerpts from the book because I, I, it kept all the images the same size. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a convenience. So one way they can uh, see it closer is to get the book. And maybe Emma, you could put that um, link in the chat now. The book. Yeah. I so, love you let me make a quilt to be the cover. Yeah. So is there anything that, um, since we've just got about um, 30 seconds left before we need to do some closing slides, um, what is something that you're working on now that you that you could share with us or people could go and look at or? Well, uh, primarily I'm working on physical recovery. I've, I've now learned my thyroid doesn't work, which explains why my entire body hurts, which means yes. I can't sew. But the next quilt is going to be just a list of dates, probably like a hundred dates in a grid um, of the last 100 mass shootings and just let the dates sit there. Wow. Um, and just call it, you know, just so you can see the frequency. And that's what I think I want it to be. It's not going to be about the number of deaths. It's just the frequency of these events has become, you know, one a day. Yeah. On average. Um, more on weekends, less during the week, but pretty much one a day. So I, with a hundred, I'm going to get through like three months and wow. that's going to be terrible. That's going to be tragic. I, I yeah. believe. Well, Thomas, I know that, um, uh, you have been, your work and this talk has been much appreciated by this audience. And we would love to have you back on to talk about that piece in the future and the other work that you're doing. I want to thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Yeah. And um, we, you have uh, information about um, how to reach Thomas, how to see his work further, and you can find the Quilt Alliance um, at www.quiltalliance.org. And remember, this is our 30th anniversary this year. Um, and I hope you'll uh, celebrate with us by checking out our website, becoming a member, just get involved. Um, next week talk, the next week's textile talk is Emerging Materials Biotextiles. Oh, that sounds so interesting. Fashion Institute of Technology presented by Sakwa. I hope you'll all join us. I'm going to sign off now for our video of sponsors. Again, thank you sponsors. And I hope you all will um, look them up too. Thanks everybody.